Man, oh man, this is a good one. David Balzer is a man after my own heart. Whenever we get together and we start talking about revival and the power of God and the presence of God, it just stirs me up every single time. And that's exactly what happened in this interview. It was actually, I actually was hoping to get it started even before we sat down because for a good chunk of time before we even started doing this interview, we were just talking about the stories of God moving and just how awesome he is. And so in this interview, we share a lot. He shares his story as we often do with our new debt and our new guests, but also just we start going into the glory of God and the power of God. And so I'm really excited for you to see this one. Uh, this one, Katie Beard was not with me. She wasn't able to make it to this particular interview, but she'll be back soon with our other interviews. And so uh, I also wanted to make an announcement. Revival Carriers is growing and we are beyond just a podcast now. For the past several weeks, I have been teaching online courses called The Thread of Revival. And our website very soon, I am actually working on some courses that are coming up. And the very first one, I'm turning the Threads of Revival into an e-course that you'll be able to get off of our website. I'll keep you updated on that. There are a few more weeks left of class. And then once we're finished with the class, we're going to turn into an e-course with all kinds of resources that are going to set you on fire. There's a lot of church history on there. If you've been watching our, our uh, the videos that I've been making, just these little two, three minute snippets about church history. Well, imagine something that's 10 plus hours that is just church history and all these different threads of how of all these different revivals and men and women of God and how uh, these there are these common threads that run throughout all of them. I go really deep into those topics. And so that course is going to be available in the next month or two. Like I said, I'll keep you updated. The next course I'm going to be doing is is on the joy of the Lord, on joy, on breaking depression, anxiety and walking in the joy of the Lord. There's so much to that and that'll be coming up after the threads of revival. Revival. So there's a lot happening right here on Revival Carriers along with this podcast. It's really exciting. We also have a newsletter that we're starting here in the next couple of weeks. And uh, as, as the, the the other courses launch, we'll be t I'll be sending out teachings through a, just exclusively through the newsletter and through the our, our list online. So if you want to sign up for the Revival Carriers newsletter where you'll get exclusive teachings, you'll get uh, all kinds of access and coupons and things like that for the courses that are going to be coming up. It's going to be really, really awesome. I'm going to be doing a lot more. Uh, I'm going to be working a lot with this newsletter because I find it to be a much more intimate uh, way, uh, platform than just doing videos. Because a lot of times on YouTube, people aren't really able to comment, but I want to be able to do more. And this newsletter is going to give an opportunity for you to receive teachings, for you to receive access, even early access to some of these courses that we're going to be doing, some maybe even some behind the the scenes and some interviews and all kinds of things that'll happen through this newsletter. So if you haven't signed up, make sure you sign up and uh, we will, you can go to revivalcarriers.com and you'll be able to sign up for our list there. And I'll also, uh, as we get closer on these videos, as we get closer to launching the newsletter, I'll add a link to be able to sign up for that newsletter here on YouTube as well. And the other formats, uh, Anchor and other Spotify and Apple uh, um, Apple Music and all the other places, Apple Podcasts, everywhere that are that Revival Carriers goes, there will be links to be able to sign up. So whatever platform you're watching this on or listening on, you can sign up for our newsletter. And it isn't just a newsletter where we send out news. There's going to be all kinds of other resources for you there as well. So thank you for joining us. I hope you enjoy this. I know you're going to be blessed, and uh, just we'll, we're it's going to be awesome. I don't even know what to say. I'm just I'm at a loss for words. I'm so excited about this one. All right, everyone, welcome back to Revival Carriers. I'm here with David Balzer, who is going to be, uh, I'm really excited to interview him today. I've wanted to interview him for a while. He has an awesome heart for the Lord and a great passion for the things that God is doing and revival and just the, the word of the Lord. So today we're just going to be uh, interviewing him and hearing what he has to say, what the Lord's doing in his life and hear his story. So thank you, David, and welcome to oh, the Revival Carriers. Thank you, Alan. I appreciate it. Yeah. So uh, can we just start out? We usually do this with our new guests. Would you just share your story, share your testimony with us? Absolutely. Um, I, uh, I grew up in a, in a Christian home, I guess you would say. My mother was a Methodist. My father didn't know uh, the Lord, but he went along because he loved mom. So we went to church, uh, in and out of church, non-denominational. Um, long story short, I didn't really give my heart to the Lord until I was 24. Hmm. 
And like most people who have a story or testimony, I was at the rock bottom. Um, you know, the whole nine yards, drugs and all that kind of stuff. And just the simple truth that we were, my mom and I, my biological mom and I, I was adopted and I met her and our life fell apart. Unbeknownst to me, my biologic mom said she prayed for me every day. She gave her heart uh, to the Lord shortly after she had uh, lost me to, uh, to my parents. And um, I kind of believe her. And so she was uh, aware of why things were happening the way they were. So she had given her heart back to the Lord. And during that process of time, I remember coming into a room. Now, you got to understand, we were out in the middle of nowhere. We didn't have a car. Uh, her husband was in jail for selling drugs. Um, we were in Mobile, Alabama. Uh, well, Monroe, Alabama, and we didn't know anybody really. Hmm. And so, um, anyways, I went into a room. I sat down. We just had beds. You know, we had no, you know, just mattresses in the house, basically. The house is pretty empty. It's a nice house. It's out in the middle of nowhere. But um, I walked in the room and I said, Mom, I'm going to heaven. And I didn't pray the sinner's prayer or anything like that. And I, I remember I had a couple of tears, and I woke up the next morning just hungry for God. Hmm. And so that's what started my journey. And the Lord started right off the bat talking, uh, doing stuff for me. You know, I was who I was at that time. I, was, I didn't do anything. I was a bum. I got my first job. I got a scholarship uh, through Alabama Southern Community College, uh, full-ride scholarship with singing and all those things. And God began to move in my life. And, of course, I was still carrying baggage, so I screwed up a couple things <laughs> between now and then. But, um, yeah, so God showed me he was real, and he saved me. And um, in 1997, he filled me with the Holy Spirit. Mm. And that's what really changed my, my walk with the Lord as far as intimacy is concerned. I think I drove my dad crazy. <laughs> I pray in tongues and talk top of my talk of my top of my lungs um for you know for a while every night when i come home you know because it was just me and god and um from there i basically found a church a home church the lord directed me there there's another story i just really believe god wants to talk uh speak to us and lead us and i was a young christian so i didn't know any better i didn't have a mentor i didn't have a teacher i just on the fly praying in the spirit reading the word knowing god wanted me to go to a whole uh full gospel church and so I prayed about it and he used my brother who's not even saved and I went to this church called Victory Faith in Iowa my mom had passed away living with my dad and that's when everything started to grow for me hmm. and um, so I volunteered every time the doors were open and all that stuff and then God called me to go to Bible college and when I went to Bible college, that was a supernatural act of, of faith because at the very end of it all before I left yeah, he made a way for me to go. Mm. And so when I went there, I was on my own for five years, you know, and learning about the Lord and, and learning about the things of God and, and all of those things. And more and more and more, I felt God was calling me to preach and, and all those things. And that's what I've been doing now for the last 20 years of my life um, is trying to serve the Lord the best I know how. And, mm. um, the reason why I really appreciate you, Alan, is the simple fact of you, you got me hungry about revival. You got me hungry about um, your knowledge of how things really were produced through prayer and all these wonderful people that you talk about. But, you know, I was saved during the time of the Brownsville revival. Yeah. So I was able to um, see the power of God. And, you know, so he was real to me at the very beginning. And um, that was a story in itself. So tell, tell us about the Browns Re Brownsville revival. What it, when you say you saw the, the power of God, what did you see? For me, it was more deliverance, I guess you would say, the, the, the baptismals of people shaking under the mm. power and everything. And my mom, since she was um, my biological mom, uh, Linda, uh, she knew about this. I didn't know about it, you know, and she explained it to me that, you know, they're not being hurt or anything. It's really the power of God. And I would hear testimony after testimony about people throwing away drugs and, and all of those things. So it was the power of God. But the greatest thing that I remember is the m multitudes of people that would get in line 8, 10, 12 hours before the service began at night and fill the street, if you will, or the where they are in Brownsville. They would just wait. And the people would begin to sing songs and worship God. And I just remember that. 
And as soon as, and as soon as they opened the door, of course, we rushed in. And it was filled up just like that. I mean, it wasn't a very big sanctuary, maybe 1,200, 1,500 people. Mm. But I just remember just people talking about the expectation of God. And, and just it was like true up three or four months after I got saved went to the Brownsville Revival. And unbeknownst to me, my wife actually went to the Brownsville Revival. You know, she lived in Pennsylvania. I was living in Iowa. So, you know what I mean? Yeah. And we met at Bible college. And wow. so we would all had that same flavor. And she'd come out of a assembly of God, not necessarily believing in the power of God, because there's a big division there and sure. with that, you know. But we all had the same experience. And we came together at Bible college, at Pastor Parsley's World Harvest uh, Bible College at the time. And... Um, it was just seeing the power of God. Now I didn't see no, I didn't see no, I didn't see any miracles, but I was in contact with the presence of God, and you knew it was real and it wasn't fake. And you know, uh, at Brownsville they pray for everybody, and um, at that time, John Kilpatrick and all them guys would come through and lay hands on people. Now I didn't feel anything, didn't fall on the ground, didn't none of that. Mm -hmm. But somebody who we brought with us from Monroeville, she shook for three days after. Wow. Every time we went to her house, she couldn't she couldn't go to work because she couldn't stop shaking. Wow. So, yeah, so I got to see some of those things. So it was really it was really cool. Wow. Really so cool. with the Brownsville Brownsville revival, because that was before my time, I never I never experienced it and. I know that there are a lot of people that hear about that revival and even his, more historic revivals. And we were just talking about this before we started. What what has changed? What do you think? What do you think was the spark for the Brownsville revival? What caused that to break out? And how could people go back to that today? Well, I was able to. John Kirkpatrick did a like a documentary on it. He began to talk about. Two years prior to that, he was just, he wanted more of God. Mm. And so he talked about how he would walk into that sanctuary, shut off every light and moan mm. and groan and cry out to God about there's got to be more, there's got to be more. And then God would come and tell him there was more and there will be more. And every time he would hit the pulpits after hearing from God, it was like nothing happened. And he was very discouraged, but he kept praying mm. and his whole congregation would pray. They prayed for two years. That doesn't seem very long, but they prayed for two years. And he said on Father's Day, you know, the famous day when the Holy Spirit entered the room and took over the whole thing when Steve Hill was there. And that's what he said. But it all come with a desperate. He was desperate. He mm. knew there was more. He wasn't seeing more. And he, he wanted more. And I don't think he, he, he knew how it was going to come other than just praying. Now, I'm using my own words. I, for him, he didn't really explain it. He was mentored by a, a gentleman that really taught him how to pray. And so prayer was a part of his life. He just didn't understand how come, you know, the, the God of the Bible wasn't real. And um, in the sense of he wanted to see the power of God. Yeah. And man, he did. And they did for like seven years, I guess. It was pretty crazy. How long were How long were you there for? I, to be honest with you, I was only there one day. Wow. My my wife was there one week. That's probably why I didn't see too many miracles. Yeah. But the impression that it left upon me, the the Brownsville revival was so real to me, or it it bears witness with me so much because it was it was always about repentance. Hmm. It was always about you got to get your life right. You know, and it's, it seemed to measure up a lot with what Jesus would speak of, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And then the miracles would happen, you know. And, and Steve Hill would only preach for like 10, 15 minutes. And then that famous uh, young lady that would uh, sing that song about um, come to the mercy seat, come to the altar, and people would rush to the altar. Um, I was more impacted when I was at Bible college watching those um, baptismals than mm -hmm. anything else. I would sit there and just weep. Just weep. And I was, you know, because that to me, changing the heart of a man or a woman is the, it, it's truly, I don't want, it, it's the greatest miracle ever. Yeah. Because you don't only get saved, you, you, you get born again and you have an opportunity to have a relationship with the Lord. There's so much power in baptisms. It's amazing how little emphasis we put on it. There's very little teaching on baptism or the power of it. I just did an interview yesterday with a woman named Jordana Keel. She's from Texas, and she has a, a, a very strong online ministry that she's had for quite a while. 
and she is part of a cowboy church down there in Texas. I've heard of them. And yeah, yeah, I've heard of them. Cool. They, they, uh, she was, she's a photographer, so he, she had taken quite a bit of video of several baptisms, and the Lord woke her up in the middle of the night one night and told her, I want you to post sort of like a... Oh, what's it called? It's not a collage. It's like a series of, of videos okay. uh, showing the different baptisms that have happened in the church. And she said, well, she thought, well, I, it's just baptisms. Like, who's going to be interested? But she, she was faithful, and she posted it. She made it in the middle of the night, posted it on TikTok, just this random couple-minute video. And in the morning, it had over a million views. And oh, my word. Be, it went up to, I think right now it's at 4 million views. Just this picture of just people getting baptized. Because there's something so powerful about it that seems so simple. It's pretty, it's, it's a fascinating to me. I will say this, um, you know, I feel like, because I, I minister in prison, I've been doing that for a little bit, and um, the men want to be baptized, right? Mm. Because that's a point of contact for them that their life is new. You know, they're prisoners, or they're serving their time. Yeah. And I feel, I, I don't know how to put my hand on it, but I concur, I agree with you that, that baptism is a spiritual experience. Although for us, it's an outward sign, you know, you have to go through the theological part of it. But uh, setting this theological part of it aside, the experience that you have, I remember when I was baptized, I was baptized in the Alabama River. It was in March. I got saved in March 12, 1996, and it was cold and it was muddy. And it, what was crazy was we, uh, uh, Brother Birch, who came all the way from Mississippi to baptize me, mm. you know, uh, I love that man. He's gone to be with the Lord. But um, regardless, I come up out of the water and it was just so clean. I just felt so clean. It was amazing. And then, you know, I got in the back of his truck you know, and rode home oblivious to it being so cold and everything. Yeah, there's a definite, definite um, experience that I think we're missing out on um, because I think people are can be changed in, in a major way through through being baptized in water, For you know, sure. in that way. Absolutely. And we don't talk about it enough. Yeah. I want to go back to you were talking about in the Brownsville Revival how they would go in and they would groan and they would— they would, it was this desperation. You use that word desperation. So I, I want to ask, do you think that there's something lacking there today in our church? This Leonard Ravenhill as well. I, I love Leonard Ravenhill and his, his, just his heart for revival. And he would often talk about travailing in prayer. Do you think that perhaps the church as a whole today kind of has missed out on that, that concept, that doctrine, and just the move of, of travailing in prayer, for the groaning for the Lord to move? I would say... Uh, for my generation, I mean, I just turned 50 and below. Um, I don't think we have a clue what that means. Mm. Um, we're not, we've never been instructed. I don't think you can instruct somebody in groaning, right? Um, but maybe you can instruct people into following your heart with the cry of God. You know, God comes on you in certain ways and stay in that area and tell. Because I can remember that John Kapakra would give specific instruction and say, don't worry about these ladies that are on the front row. They would literally be bowed over, and, and um, they would literally be b crying and groaning mm. for souls. And um, I remember when 9-11 happened, not to get off topic, but I remember 9-11 happened, and I was in Bible college when it happened. And um, when that second plane hit and, and we prayed the first time, it was a generic prayer. It was like, you know, be with them and, you know, just a good prayer. And then the second plane that hit, all of a sudden, our chaplain, uh, our elder Canfield, he began to pray. And as soon as he got the first words out, the presence of God came down and groanings groanings came and I remember like feeling like the Lord saying this is what I want to hear this is mm. what I want to hear and you know I don't know how that happens I don't know how you how you how you get to that place of, of groaning I'm sure hunger is a part of it I just never I've experienced it but I've never like uh, old timers talk about praying through I don't even really know what that means yeah. uh, other than that so I think we're missing it in um as far as in america i don't know about africa i've watched videos of people in africa just groaning and, and mm -hmm. praying and travailing in prayer um so and i've watched my wife do it a couple times on a couple of occasions it's almost like she was overcome mm. 
by, by it. You can feel the presence of God come in the room. So I really, I, I really believe, obviously, uh, Romans 8, 27, right, that the Holy Spirit makes groanings with us with words cannot be uttered. I think that's something that definitely has to be missing because we would have more of an impact because when it took place, souls were saved. You know, yeah. when it took place, the power of God, you know, um, rang out in a building in a place like that. So, yeah. Yeah, I, I, there's one verse that's kind of been in my heart for years and years that is just sort of one of the th- those things I meditate on a lot, which is that verse in the Bible that said where God told his people, if you seek me with all of your heart, you will mm-hmm. find me. And I often wonder what what specifically that means, because it can mean all kinds of things. I'm sure it's an individual thing, right? Because what is all of my heart may be different, may look different from what someone else's all of their heart could be. Yeah. And I often think, I think about, you talked about the old timers. I love reading those stories, especially back during the Great Awakenings, the women, they would have these rugs in their living room that they were, that they were, was their prayer rugs. And they would do that where they would come together as a group. And if there was a prayer need, they would make a commitment not to leave that rug until the answer was given. Mm. And they would stay there for hours, sometimes days, until the Lord spoke. And Smith Wigglesworth did the same thing. He had a severe anger problem. And so he locked himself in a closet and he said, Lord, I'm not leaving this closet until you take this anger away from me. And he, I don't know how long he was in there, but when he came out, he said I, he refused to leave. And then God took the anger from him. He came out and he never struggled with anger again. Wow. So there's, there's definitely something to that of just that that grit of I'm not moving that even though it doesn't seem like anything happened is happening like in the Brownsville revival where you're there for two years doesn't seem like then anything is happening and then all of a sudden that outbreak happens but it's two years of is this is this worth it yeah your mind your mind that's the thing like we like as, as as wonderful as every church I was a volunteer at or went to volunteer at, went to uh, as wonderful as being at, at World Harvest was and the presence of God was thick and wonderful and and people got saved but but the impact that God had on a culture like if we need anything we need revival that shakes the culture yeah you know look at Brownsville today and see that Brownsville where it happened is a very bad place to live. Like it, it affected people, but for some reason we didn't affect. It didn't affect the culture, changing the culture, changing men's hearts. You would think if you get saved that the byproduct of that would be a changed heart, but there, there's something we're missing. Yeah. And and it could. How do you get yourself to a place where uh, where you're willing to stay on the carpet? Right. I think you have to believe that God is hearing your prayers. You really have to believe that he's going to do it now and not relegate it to somewhere in the future. And I think at least with Pentecost, where I grew up, full gospel people, we've lost that edge and we've pushed everything off to someday it's going to happen or we know it's going to happen. Even when people prophesy, they talk about how this is coming. This is Well, Mm -hmm. if why do we have to wait till that day? And I think we're programmed, if I want to use a word, yeah. to like not persevere because we we believe the lie that you know it's just going to happen and it's not it's God's timing, it's not our timing. Yeah. And what you're telling me and what you've learned and studied in revival is that you can move the hand of God by staying in prayer in a same place with the same prayer until you know that it's been answered. Well, that's how Charles Finney, his whole ministry was based on that because he was part of a church. He has the, one of the funniest stories to me because he was a lawyer and he was part of a church. He, he would sing on their worship team okay. and he was not a believer. And that's how the church right. was back in those days. He was singing on the worship team, not a believer. He was a lawyer who would go to church just to argue with the pastor. Like that, he, that was his favorite thing was to be confrontational with the pastor. And there was a group of women that would pray in that church. Every single time he was there, those women were there praying. And he said he watched them for a year. And he said they would pray the same thing every single day and never received, never got an answer to their prayers. And so one day he gets off the platform where he's in the church and these women come up to him and say, Mr. Finney, we think that you need God. We need to pray for you. And he said, I'm paraphrasing, but he said, you know, you're probably right. I probably do need God, but your prayer, I don't need your prayers because God clearly isn't listening to you. And he said, so your prayers would do nothing for me. 
and he left. And instead, uh, but that whole interaction impacted him to the point where he thought, there ha- if God is real, there's a reason why their prayers are not being answered. So he went and he, because he was a lawyer, he knew how to study things out. He studies the Bible for quite a while, trying to understand if God is real, what is the key here? And he came to this conclusion and he wrote it in his, in his autobiography. He wrote that he concluded that the reason those women were not receiving their prayers was because, was because they had no expectation of it actually happening. And so he based his whole ministry on if you pray something, you have to ex- you have to have expectation that will happen and actually make physical movements as if this is going to happen because I asked God for it to happen. And all of those miracles, his, the whole revival that he that came through him was all based on if you pray it, you better expect it to happen. Wow. And we we definitely I know for me it's easy to fall in that trap of every day. I actually had to change things with my my two boys because every night I would go up and we'd pray and I just got into this rhythm of praying the same prayer every night just real quick just go up and just pray and I had God convicted to me about it like no you're just you're just parroting off words there's mm-hmm. no heart in it and so I started changing it to now I go up there and I really try to center in on the Holy Spirit and really pray something that's real that I can bring my kids in and say we're gonna pray this and we're really gonna and we're gonna Say something that isn't just words that are empty. There's no worth to them because it's just ritualistic. Yeah. And I think I think that's another thing that we we kind of have lost. Not everyone. There are a lot of people, but they, we kind of have lost that understanding of you have to have expectation for anything to happen. My pastor, uh, Pastor Parsley, is famous for quoting, "The atmosphere of expectancy is the breeding ground for miracles." Yeah. And I wonder if he got that from. Finney's writings or whatever. It could be. Um, but there is no doubt that I remember Pastor um, talking to us about how God shared with them, whosoever shall say mm. unto this mountain, be that removed. And he talked about how God exploded in his spirit, and he spent two hours walking around what is now was Alpha Hall then, was the church, walking around saying, I am a whosoever, I am a whosoever, and just declaring and moving in and revelation. So that brings me to a point is that, I think we need our eyes open to the fact that God expects us to have expectancy. Mm-hmm. And, if, and if we can't have expectancy, we should pray until we do have expectancy, which is kind of redundant, right? Pray to, <laughs> but you understand what I mean? Yeah, yeah. Well, the idea of, of, okay, Jesus says when you pray, when you fast, and when you give, that there's an open reward. And we understand that open reward is a public display of God's power because he talks about going into the secret place where nobody sees you, believing that God sees you. And so I have to agree, I agree with Mr. Finney simply because it has to be true because the fruit of that understanding bore out the revival in which he's famous for. Yeah. And there's a guy, Jonathan Shuttlesworth, hmm. who I'm, I, I love him a lot, uh, you know, and I see there's fruit in his ministry and, and, you know, you know, I want to model that and I want to learn how that is because we talk about faith a lot. You know, we talk about our words a lot. We talk about all those things, but if it's not mixed with why am I guarding my mouth or why am I making plans for God to do something? Well, it's because you have to believe and believing is it should move us. And if it doesn't move us, and I, you know, it's like what you said, it just becomes redundant. And God's, you know, it's not, God's not here and he knows it's like, shut up, please. I mean, you're just doing the thing over and over again. My whole thing is God had brought me into a place. I prayed the Jabez prayer, Mm. like for the last 30 days, because at the end of the book, it says pray. And I felt like the Holy Spirit was saying, you need to do this. So I did out of obedience. And every time I prayed, I prayed in different locations. I prayed up to the town of Brookville. And this expectation of God really moving. And nothing happened. Mm. For, it's only 30 days, right? right? <laughs> nothing happened on the outside. But on the inside, changing of my heart to believe that God will do something for me. I think that's another thing, too. Do you believe that God will do it for you? Yeah. These guys believed 
All these guys that you study, these women that you studied, believe that God would use them. And that's why they did. That's why they endured the persecution. That's why they, they did the miracles. That's why they, they, they didn't care what men would say. They just did what they did because they were convinced. Paul said, I am persuaded. It's like that whole, I don't mean to preach, but it's that whole idea of can we lock in together to where we actually believe where two or three are gathered together in my name, I'm in the midst. If we touch and agree, it will be done. This whole idea of it will be done is, is, a, is, is challenging me to a place of sometimes I get frustrated because it's showing me either my doubt or my unbelief. Hmm. I, I don't think it's so much unbelief. But anyways, these guys had to struggle with those things. I mean, you talk about it. Yeah, but at the same time, they were able to pick themselves back up and put them in that place of expectation. We want to yeah. see revival. We have to believe that God will do it. Yeah, and I, I like to look at the humanity in people as well, especially these old revivalists, people that I, I just love. I love seeing their defects, not because I'm trying to nitpick at them, but because sometimes it, they just seem so unattainable. Yeah. It just seems impossible. How how am I supposed to do what these guys were doing? It's impossible. Yeah. But whenever, But that's because... The history books usually just show the highlights. They don't show who they really were. And I love some of it. For, for example, Catherine Coleman, she's really famous for yep. healing, and yet she died of an enlarged heart. Huh. And there are, I even look at even in scripture, the, one of the most fascinating character studies for me is Elijah and Elisha. Okay. Because Elijah, we all know he was taken up in a whirlwind. He never died. Yeah. Whereas Elisha, he, he died of sickness. But Elisha had double the miracles that Elijah did. He had a bigger ministry. But Elisha, not only did he die of a sickness, but he also, his, Elijah had Elisha, that was his helper, mm -hmm. and Elisha had Gehazi. Yes. And Elisha became this mega prophet. Gehazi ended up a leper because he, he was deceitful. Yeah. And it's amazing because the, the humanity there, Elijah's like this unattainable person, but then you have Elisha who was full of defects, and yet God still used him. It, it, it was incredibly powerful, his ministry. Elisha actually was the one who they threw that body into, into his yep. tomb, and the body came back to life yep. because of the anointing on his bones. Yeah, It's just, it's yeah. wild. I love that. Catherine Kuhlman, she, was, she, was, she loved clothing. It was just a human side of her. She had all this really nice, fancy clothing because she, she just had a love for nice clothes. Mm -hmm. And we often forget that because we, we look at these great revivals, but we forget these were just people. They had the same amount of hours every day as we do. They have the same struggles. They had the same issues. Even Jesus had, the Bible's very clear. He struggled with all the same things that yep, we did, absolutely. but he overcame them. And so I feel like even for myself, because what, what you're saying is I'm thinking about it as well. It's just, man, we are capable of so much more than we live out. God has given us so much more ability than we walk in. And a lot of it, I think, is just that lack of expectation. Thinking, especially once you've lived, like for us, we've been in ministry for a long time. Yeah. It is easy to get to that point where like, well, I guess that maybe, maybe I've peaked. Maybe this is, I look at, you hear some of those stories, some of those young people like uh, the Welsh revival, Evan Roberts, he's 22 and the entire world knows who he is. Yeah. And then I'm like, I'm almost 40. And <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. And, and you, yeah. Like we were just talking before, like for me, like my frustration with no manifestation of the power of God. Mm -hmm. Like it Anna, if I would take a, a quick gander at myself, you know, and then I'm always saying, okay, well, maybe you didn't pray too much. Maybe you should fast before you go in and do a Sunday morning service. You know, all these different questions. I think for me, this year is going to be a year of discovery. I got to answer some of those questions. There has to be an an There is an answer for why it's, and if it is doubt, right? Uh, I was just basically uh, talking to myself about stop beating yourself up. Mm. You did this and this, you know, and, um, and, and, but you also did this, which was better than you've ever done in your life. So it's like yeah. this whole idea of not running your own self down too, but, but the whole revival, I think for ministers as well, and I don't want to exclude anybody that's in the church, no longer, sure. but for ministers as well, we're, that's especially full gospel ministers, especially people who see the power of God, hear about the power of God. And you're saying, Lord, what is it? Is there something wrong with me? Is there something I'm doing wrong? 
And then you get, you know, if, you, if you're a minister for any length of time, you have all these scriptures swirling around in your head <laughs> that just you can nitpick at things, and, and, and it's, it's just crazy. I think if we just settle on the fact that we're not going to stop till it happens, I think that's the simplest way of doing it. And if we're doing something wrong, believing as we pray in the Spirit that God and reading the Word, that the Lord will direct us in that. Um, but if he can use... Uh, I did not know that about Elisha. I knew that about Gehazi, right, that he did what he did, you know. Um, but the reality is is that God uses human beings. He loves us. Mm -hmm. He doesn't want to leave us out, and he'll work with us. Um, not to say everything we do is right, obviously, but, you know, look at Solomon for crying out loud. Yeah. He started out strong, then all of a sudden by the end, you know, he was wayward in a lot of ways. It's like... Um, we just need to believe that God wants to do it for our generation. We need it. We need a revival that's. It starts out with the hearts being changed, and yeah. then we need to move in the direction of purpose and calling and all that. That people are not locked up inside of a, a, a four walls, as we would say it, where they're actually free to pursue what God's called them to do. Whether it's a doctor, lawyer, all those things, I really believe that when you find your purpose, you and you find your passion, you will have this strength. And of course, you're anointed and called to do that. Um, you'll make a difference. And I think culture shaping needs to needs to come all the way back around in a circle. Like in America, you know, Christians had Hollywood at one time. Christians had the education at mm -hmm. one time. You know, higher learning. All Christians. When I say Christian, Christ was the center of all those things. And then the, you know it. Everything goes around, comes around. This is on the positive side. I, I believe, you know, what's, what's Ecclesiastes say? You know, there's not something that's ever been that will be. And yeah, There's nothing new idea. under the sun. Yeah, yeah, nothing new under the sun. That we repeat history. Mm -hmm. That America would repeat history. And that we would once again become this, this beacon, this hope, this light to the world that, you know, we're not immoral and we're not, you know, uh, wayward. We're, I, I'm convinced we're at the cusp of a huge revival. I it, Just for me, and of course, history is not scripture, but history does repeat itself. Yes. And if you look at any of these major revivals that have happened, it doesn't matter if it's the Welsh revival, it doesn't matter if it's the Great Awakenings, it doesn't matter which one, They especially the Salvation Army is an amazing example of that. If you look at these revivals, they were, even the apostles, they were all in a position that we're in right now where it seemed like the world, for lack of a better phrase, was going to hell in a handbasket. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And just think of the apostles. We look at our world right now and we think, oh, there's all this, the world is rampant with sin right now. The United States rampant with sin. There's, mm -hmm. you got all the homosexuality and the transsexual movement, all this stuff that is clearly being thrown in the face of God. Yeah. Clearly against scripture. It yep. is sin. Yeah. And we think this, we must be the only ones. This is, we're the only ones that have, this has ever happened to. But in the time of the apostles, Emperor Nero, he's known for persecuting the apostles. He's the one who martyred both Paul and Peter. He beheaded, he of course crucified Peter upside down. Yeah. He beheaded, but that was Emperor Nero. But what a lot of people don't know is Emperor Nero, he, before his mother and his elders died, he was married to a woman named Papaya. Okay. And whenever his mother and his elders, the people who basically oversaw him as a young prince, when they died and he had no one over him anymore, he beat his wife to death. And then he got married to a young boy. Hmm. And in the wedding, he dressed as the bride. Oh, I did not know that. Yeah, he was a crazy dude. Okay. And he was, so it was during this time. And as, as a matter of fact, whenever Isaiah was ministering, and whenever Sennacherib, there was Isaiah and Hezekiah, whenever they were in that okay. big siege, yeah. Sennacherib, the general, he was the one that surrounded it. If you study Sennacherib, he was also known as living as a homosexual. If you look at any of the busts of him, they would make him have a huge beard. Mm -hmm. And the reason why is because he was actually very effeminate in real life. And he didn't want anyone to think he was weak. So he would tell his people to make him very burly and manly. Huh. And so what we're going through today, the, the sin and all the stuff that's happening, this is not new. It's not new under the sun. This is stuff... That is, we, as a matter of fact, America being, when it was founded on Christian values, that was the new, that had never been done before. Okay. It was the first time. Every other society before us has gone through all of these things. It's just, we happen to have been raised in a Christian nation, a very unique place on the planet. Yeah. If you go to Thailand right now, 
the child prostitution is illegal. The, all that stuff is legal. And they've been like that for generations. So we're at this cusp where we have, we have been in this nation where God was glorified to the great awakening, the, the Brownsville revival, all these different revivals. And the world, ha- the church has followed the world in many ways. And the world has kind of, they're having their moment right now. But we're right at that perfect moment where mm. we could have what's uh, the John Wesley disease, which John Wesley disease was when John Wesley would, uh, when the revival was breaking out with John Wesley, the police would walk in the neighborhood where he was ministering, just because that's what police do, and they would find bodies on the street. And when they would go, they would smell their breath. And if it smelled like alcohol, it was a drunk, and they would take him to the drunk tank. But if it didn't, they said, oh, this is the Wesley disease, because John Wesley had prayed for them, and they had fallen under the whole power of the oh, Holy Spirit on the side of the road. Oh, I did not know that. Yeah. Thank you. That's yeah. pretty killer. So we're, we're in those. I believe that's coming, where the Wesley disease, <laughs> the Holy that's Spirit, really is cool. going to start flowing. That's, that's really I. I, you know, I've been brought up with the expectation, you hear it all the time, about revival. We're on the cusp. We're on the cusp. We're on the cusp. Um, and, you know, when you're in worship, sometimes you get a glimpse of the future in some ways. That's, I mean, that's one of the reasons why I like being here, because it's not so religious in that sense. And, and, and to realize that, you know, it doesn't take God long to do anything. Yeah. The suddenlies of God come because of the long, tra- you know, I don't transition, the long periods where he's quote unquote silent, where nothing's happening, mm-hmm. where no prayers are being answered. And it would be an amazing thing to see God not only transform people's lives, but transform a culture where the people who were against God, the Pauls of life, if you will, suddenly have this Damascus Road. It doesn't even have to be that. They wake up different. Mm-hmm. I mean, I had two tears rolled down my face and said, Mom, I'm going to heaven. I didn't pray a sinner's prayer or anything. Now, you know, I probably prayed the sinner's prayer many times in Awanas and all that up. But yeah. at that age, or at yeah, 24, I didn't. I just, and I can't even say why. It must have just came out of my spirit or something because I had no faculties to grist or theology to understand what was happening. Yeah. And, um, uh, so what about that, where God doesn't have to do something spectacular mm-hmm. and people are not shaking or the power of God to where people go to bed one night, they wake up the next morning and truly the word yeah. that's supposed to grow day and night, that whole idea, that they wake up different. Yeah. Moms wake up different, dads wake up different, kids wake up different, and it's, it's a silent thing, although I know God's going to make him, himself known. It's just the reality of what we really want is we want our lives changed. Mm-hmm. It's not, you know, if we don't look, if we look outward and we say sin, 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 and, and we're not looking inward, we're in, we're in trouble, right? Because that's the whole judgment thing. And I don't think we're there. I think, you know, for uh, for me, even that simple thing, Lord, where's your miracles at? These, these, these men need your miracles. Well, God's not the problem. Maybe my heart's not right. Maybe I'm not, you know, groaning. Maybe I need to grow. Well, how do I get there? Well, I just keep taking steps to God till, you know, am I really looking for the manifestation of groaning? Or every time I see them, should I, should I, when I see them and hear their story, should I weep? Should I be touched with uh, their their infirmities like Jesus was? You know, this whole idea of just staying, sticking and staying, sticking and staying and still, until it happens. We got to have a revival. Yeah. I've heard people talk about how if you want revival, you can have it. I read a book. I don't know if that was Ravenhill or if it was somebody else because you would know better because I didn't study Ravenhill. But it was, it was a, I was reading a book in, in prison, and the guy said, every church that I've been to, we've had revival. Hmm. And basically it boils down to the fact that the people wanted it. Yeah. So it's like, is it that easy? I don't want to mean easy, but is it that simple yeah. to really put it in your heart? Because the hard part is the grind. Mm-hmm. It is the easy part is I got this inspiration from God and I'm going to go do it. Now, the hard part is the grind because there's always a grind. There's always a process. There's always a, a wilderness experience that comes with everything before you hit that water hole or that well or however you want to describe it. Yeah. And I think if we're willing to do that, I think there's a lot of us willing to do it. It's just are, are, are we willing to wait? It's that overcoming the flesh. Yeah. Yeah. I think I think a lot of it as well going along with the expectation is certain actions. Now, people can get really weird with actions because yeah. they start doing prophetic actions. That yeah, they yeah, just, yeah. I, I find, I don't want to go on a tangent on prophecy, but it's an interesting gift 
because I believe in prophecy. I know some prophets. They're really, really awesome. But there's kind of been, a, sometimes there's a little bit of a twisting of it because there's that name it and claim it. There, that, there is truth to declaring truth. Yeah, 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 yeah. But there are the extremes that go way beyond the word of God. And sometimes I find there are, because the Bible, in, in Scripture, God would speak to the prophet and the prophet would declare the words of God. But nowadays, a lot of people, they decide they what they want God to speak. And so they'll make a declaration trying to activate what God uh, said. You know, you yeah, know, there's yeah, a difference. Yeah, but, but there is something to do. There is, there's cert- certainly something to actions behind. I was just... I, I listened to an audio Bible, and I was listening this morning. I listened to the story whenever several of the—there was this couple. There was an Israelite man. This is the Old Testament in, in Deuteronomy, I think it was. There's this Israelite man. He goes and finds a foreign woman, okay. and they're having sex in the tent. And Phineas, because of this sin that's going on, th- this plague is going through the Israelite camp, just wiping people out. It's the judgment of God. Phineas, who was this just sort of this young man at the time, who was really zealous for God, he knows that this this man is having sex with a foreign woman, which was not legal, uh, because they bring in extra gods and all. And he runs. It's a brutal story, but he goes in with a spear and impales both of them mm. in the tent. And whenever he impales them, the plague stopped. And there was something about, to me, that just stuck out to me this morning about, as brutal as that story was, there's something about taking bold action for the Lord sometimes. Not like that. But you know what I mean? Taking some bold action that can actually stop a plague, stop the the move of the enemy, or or even start a revival. But it takes these bold moves sometimes. I I have... Yeah, because I, you know, being in full gospel or the prophetic now, because now we have now we have the prophetic in the full gospel and all that, and and I've been around it, and I'm not a, against it, but the, the, but I'm, I observe it, and mm-hmm. and I, and most of the prophetic acts that are done, to me, there is no like you said a sign. This dude thrust that baboosh, it was over. I've heard, you know, from pouring stuff in water to, you know, making stuff up that this means that. I don't want to bash or nothing mm-hmm. like that. It's just the reason why I don't put any credence in it is the fact that there is no, it has to manifest in yeah, the natural. No fruit. Or it does not produce heaven's uh, will on earth. Yeah. And, you know, you get through enough of that and you leave everything off into the spirit, then you're like, and there's no tangibility to it. There's no benefit from just empty it. words. Your words, actions, you spend all night, whatever, and it's like I, I want to see. You know, God said to Samuel, "I'm not going to let your words fall to the ground." Mm-hmm. Like that type of situation, and I think you're right. Like maybe there's a sanctification that has to take place around the whole movement that we're uh, familiar with, the Word of Faith movement, and the whole idea of the prophetic. You know, I'm going to do this prophetic act now. Okay. What you know? Yeah, prophetic. two, three, four, five days later, there's still a, a year later. There's nothing. Somewhere along the line, maybe we're, we want something so bad. Not the, the people aren't bad people, or not, but we want something so bad that we're trying to not just make something happen, make stuff up to where we can maybe keep the expectation up, which is obviously man-made. Yeah, prophetic acts are great if they're from the Lord, if the Holy Spirit's guiding it. But I think in in the prophetic movement in particular. Some of the there are a lot of verses that are totally left out, which which are the verses where God talks about pr- prophets prophesying out of presumption or out of their own imagination. Yeah, there are several verses that talk about that, and it is a danger. But a lot of a lot of people in the prophetic movement, like you're talking about, they are pretty much just prophesying out of their imagination. They're just. I, I spoke with a, uh, a, pro- a prophet one time, and I like I said, I believe in prophecy. I've seen it; it's a real thing. Yeah. But he talked about the pressure of moving in the gift of prophecy because he's a well-known prophet and everywhere he goes, people always want a word. They're always coming up for a word. And he said, there's always pressure to give them a word. And there is a temptation as a prophet to just make something. Cause the truth is you can read a fortune cookie mm-hmm. and think, Oh, this is God's word for me yeah. because there are fortune cookie prophet prophecies. Yeah. It, it, there's a documentary. It's a horrible, horrible documentary called Marjo. But it, it is fascinating because in the 1920s, 1930s, child preachers were a huge deal. There were nine-year-olds preaching the gospel, mega famous. And there was this man named Marjo, 
who was one of those one of those child preachers, and he was very very famous in his day mm. as a child. And honestly, it was it was horrible because parents who were not believers they saw it as a great money maker, so they would beat their children and make the, force them to memorize sermons, which is what happened to Marjo. They named him Marjo because of Mary and Joseph. They thought it would make him sound more spiritual. When he was a baby, they named him Marjo, hmm. and they would drown him in water. They dunk his head in water to force him to memorize sermons and Holy study smokes. study preachers. It was it's a horrible documentary, and he's in it. He had a camera crew follow him around when he was a little bit older. And just the corruption that was in the church, especially in those days, how they were abusing these child preachers. But he talked about in that in that hit, that documentary, he talks about how when he was on TV, he was a televangelist, and he knew that there were ten thousand little old ladies watching, right? Mm-hmm. So he would prophesy and he say because he was never a believer his whole life, but he was a f- super famous mega preacher. Wow. And he said, I would I would stand up there and I would say, the Lord is speaking to me, and I. I see a I see a woman, and she's sitting in her kitchen watching, and on, on your refrigerator, you have a jar with money in it. And the Lord is saying that belongs to me, and you're supposed to send that in as a donation to our ministry. And he said, I know that statistically, if there are 10,000 little old ladies watching, there's going to be a few hundred that have a jar of money oh, on I, the refrigerator. Uh, back in those days, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. And so I think a lot wow. of times... it. I hear that people prophesying all the time, and there's their prophecies. Like I, I can't tell you how many times I've heard people prophesy. The Lord wants you to dance like David dances, which is all great. Yeah, they, they're encouraging words, yeah. but I think to, oftentimes we mistake encouraging words for prophecy. Absolutely, it, it's great to encourage. Yeah, obviously it's scriptural. Yes, but to call ourselves a prophet because we said something yeah. encouraging. Yeah, that's a totally different thing. Absolutely, absolutely. I um. A lot of the words that I receive that actually have validity in my life so far, I've been prophesied over people by mm-hmm. prophets. Uh, we'll use that term loosely, I guess. Um, I don't want to, you know, Lord, I believe in the prophetic and yeah. the office of a prophet. Guarantee Kim Clement was a mm-hmm. definite prophet of God. And um, But... Most of the words that ever came to pass in my life were in my own personal time with the Lord. He would give me a word, and when he gave me that word, or he would get, he would give me a, an actual a sentence or something, and then it would be backed up by Scripture. Uh, they would always come to pass. There is not one that I have not received from yeah. the Lord. And I can say this, it's not every day, right? Um, you know, the word feeds you and all that, but a specific thing I'm going to do or this I'm going to do, um, so, because we're not supposed to be seeking a prophet for a word. We got the great prophet that lives mm-hmm. within us, the Holy yeah. Spirit. And true, you know, and I don't want to get into tangents since we're talking about revival, but you're right. There's been a lot of abuses in revival. There's been a lot of those things too. Um, but this generation, I really don't know if they even know what revival is. You know, what you're doing on your podcast, you know, you're putting it out there for the whole world to see is an amazing thing because I think that, Absolutely, God will use it to prick somebody's heart, whether they're in China, whether they're in New Jersey, you know, whether they're in a rural area, whether like, you know, this is, this is real and God can, can use it because revival is necessary. And my generation, even though I was there for Brownsville for one, you know, one day, but I mean, I lived it out in yeah. Bible college and all that. We, the culture here, it seems because we're not surrounded by, I think you did, uh, um, uh, a YouTube, not YouTube, Facebook, whatever, uh, your podcast um, on the ability uh, that God is moving around the whole world. Yeah, he is. Didn't you say something about Thailand or something? Oh, yeah, he is moving. And, yeah. and, and so we need to realize that just because in America we're not seeing what, what we want to see doesn't mean that God's not moving. And so that's another part of, of uh, we need to hear you talk about these things. We need to understand these things to the depth of our heart so that we can contend for revival. Yeah, and I want to encourage everybody who watches or listens to this as well. God is moving. I was just in Nepal. This is a couple of years ago, but that I, w- I visited Nepal because with COVID, everything's locked down. But whenever I was there, there are so many people being saved in the mountains of Nepal, which is illegal. You can go to jail for six years for the gospel, for being for going to church in Nepal. 
And there are so many people coming to the Lord that there are some of the ministers there, all they're doing is baptizing people all day because they just have li- just lines of people. I, I went there and I was able to baptize some people in the middle of this river, in the, one of the most beautiful places you can imagine, in the middle of these mountains. It was incredible wow. just baptizing people because they are so hungry for the Lord. And right now, China, fastest growing church in the world, one That's of the most persecuted. Brazil. Did you know... In terms of missionaries, the United States what has is still number one sender of missionaries, and then South Korea after us. Okay. And for a long time, Brazil was one of the lowest. Mm-hmm. But now Brazil, there's such a revival in Brazil right now that they have, within just a few years, launched into the third largest sending nation of missionaries on the planet. Brazil, which who would have thought Brazil? Yeah. Because God is moving all over the world, which is another reason why I say we are primed for a revival. But I'm also tired of saying we're on the cusp, like you yeah, mentioned. Yeah, I'm tired absolutely. of saying we're on the cusp. I want us to be there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, let's hey, get I, it started. Let's start it. Yeah. Um, I, th- that warms my heart that America is still the number one. Uh, you know, it's, the nation. margins are getting thinner, but oh, we yeah. are there. But just to, like, you know, the way, you know, people talk about America now, especially in the church judgment and this and this and this, like, like they we're all beat. We're worthless now. You know, we're just so corrupted just to hear that, you know, come from you is like, wow, it's, a, it's amazing. God is still at work within the United States of America. I think one of the things that hurts my heart the most as an American myself and as a missionary who I lived overseas for 15 plus years and just recently came back to the States and still travel when I can, but is all of these missionaries and all these church members and believers that would come down to these, to Panama or Mexico or wherever it was that I was, Mm -hmm. they would come down there. And one of the first things they would do is they would start saying how much they hate America. They say, Oh, I hate America. They're God's going to judge them. God's going to burn. And I, I, I think I often thought, and Bill Johnson has talked about this as well. We as a collective church are cursing our own nation Hmm. rather than speaking life. Yes, we're in a pit. Yeah, we need revival, but we need to start speaking life over our country because if all we're doing is going around just bashing everything, well, we're not speaking life over our own nation. We'll speak life over other nations. Yeah. But we'll say, oh, God is going to do something. God's doing something in Thailand. God's doing something, but God's not moving here. Yeah. And I think we have to be careful because I just, I hear this so often from people where they're, oh, I just want to get out of this country. For me, part of the reason I moved back here is because this is where the gospel needs to be preached. Yeah. We need, we, I have it in my heart. Uh, and because I've been here such a short amount of time, doors haven't really opened. But I want to have revival meetings. I want to go to just, I, I want to preach the gospel and just invite people. Let's just seek the presence of God. Let's go for it. I want to go to different places and just start bringing, n- not that the not that preaching revival is the message because Jesus is the message. Yeah. And I often think about, because I talk about church history so much, I often have to, I, I get a little bit frustrated with myself because I'm like, I'm always talking about church history, but we should be preaching repentance. We should be pe- preaching Jesus. And I, there's so much need here. There are people, I have a friend from who's from New Zealand. He moved to California as a missionary to be a missionary in the United States from New Zealand. Oh, wow. Because we need it. Yeah. But we have to, as a church, also believe God can move here. God loves us too. He loves this country too. Absolutely. And I heard uh, people from Africa are coming over here too. And, mm-hmm. and uh, we we do. I mean, we need to be our own indigenous missionary, right? Yeah. Because you know, that's what they do in that's India right. and stuff like yeah. that. Is 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 get back to the simplicity of Christ. Get back to the gospel. Is God's not counting your sins against you, mm-hmm. and and understanding that forgiveness is av- not only available but has already been purchased, and the reality of God's love in a person's life will wreck you forever. Yes. And then there's depths of it, but there's still that first contact with it, realizing you only know yourself, I only know myself, we know what we've done. And to realize that on that brutal level that God has already forgiven us Mm -hmm. is an amazing baptism in in the love of God. And a person has changed because them that's been forgiven much loves much. It's just a response of, you know, we can talk about discipleship, but just the, the initial response to the gospel, if preached properly, not, 
you know, sow your seed to get your need and all this other right. stuff that I've been a part of. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, God's going to do a miracle for you. And we're all focused on the miracle aspect of God instead of God himself. Um, there's many, you know, crooks and crannies of, of situation, but the pure unadulterated gospel that Jesus Christ loves you and mm. it's real. Yeah. And if you uh, open your heart, you will, you will, you will have that experience that you long for. Um, and it is true and it is impactful yeah. and you'll be like everybody else that comes home and tells, you know, if you're a kid, you tell your mom and dad, I accepted Jesus. If you're a husband or a wife, you come home and they're looking at you sideways. Or, Who's this man or who's yeah. this woman? It's a real authentic experience man yeah that, that god does not disappoint at all when your heart felt from your heart i need you lord that's right you know and there's many different ways of going about that but yeah, yeah. i love to talk about it so yeah. oh yeah. man i love it so well david as we we wrap up here first of all thank you so much for your time but we oh, no, would, would you awesome. tell our audience about your podcast oh sure hey man thanks oh yeah man yeah i have a, i have a podcast i've been i've been posting the the ones i did last year uh it's called conversations with david balzer it's on uh brookvillehouseofworship.com is where you can find it all um yeah so if you go to brookvillehouseofworship.com there's a podcast section click on there look for uh conversations with david balzer that's myself sometimes i i got to get this man on my podcast alan and we're going to talk about church history because yeah. i just love to hear it and um yeah man it was a pleasure and i appreciate it uh for asking me to be a part i'm yeah. honored uh, that you would let me sit in this chair oh, I, man, I appreciate it's, that it's a lot. an honor to have you could you pray for pray oh, for us to close us out oh absolutely Heavenly Father, we just come to you right now in the name of Jesus. Father, we bless you and we praise you and we thank you for the love that you have for us. Father, as I say all the time, you know that you love us, but we need to know it. Open our eyes up, everyone that is hearing this, everyone that is viewing this, that you would come into their lives in such a way, Father, that they would understand that you love them because it is your love that transforms our life. It is your love that causes us to respond to you when you ask us to go and do things for you. Father, it is understanding that aspect that you are not doing love, you are love. So open our eyes up to that. Father, I pray for anyone out there right now that has a passion for revival. Lord, that you would, as, as you often do, spark a, a, um, a zeal within your people to see revival in wherever they live. Lord, that they don't long to go somewhere else. Lord, I can remember so many times that I would ask you, Lord, I don't want to go to Florida, and I don't want to go to Toronto, and I don't want to go to Missouri, and I don't want to, you know, fill in the blank. I don't want to go to Harrisburg, even though these places are wonderful. Lord, we need revival in our city, uh, state, wherever we're at. And Lord, I pray that you would birth a fire in people not to be moved, even though they see that they would celebrate where you're doing things. But Lord, that they would say, Father, I'm going to stay here until it happens in my town, in my home, in my life, in my school. That's what I pray, Father, in the name of Jesus, that you, Holy Spirit, that live inside of each and every one of us would stir up a hunger and thirst, a groaning that we talk about that we really didn't touch today. Lord, teach us what that is. Over, overwhelm us with your presence. Come to us that we may groan the groans that only you understand and you are truly moved by the groaning of the Spirit. Father, we thank you that you are not done with America, neither are you done with the world. And just as John has said, you did not only die for my sins, but you died for the sins of the entire world. So Lord, we thank you that the blood is speaking on the mercy seat seat and we thank you that you're hearing the voice of your son's blood over america and the world and i thank you lord you will not give us what we deserve but father you will give us what what we don't deserve and that's an outpouring of your holy spirit uh like never before or father you have truly said that in the last days you would pour out your spirit upon all flesh you said father god in malachi that you would send the spirit of elijah that would turn the hearts of the children back to the fathers and the fathers to the children least I would spite the earth with a curse. You don't want to do that, Father. That's why you're sending your spirit. So, Lord, we thank you now. We bless you now. Lord, let your angels go now out. We pray laborers into the harvest field. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Thank you so much. Amen.
Amen.